Good afternoon, Maggie Aberman. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being with us uh, at Media en Seine today. Uh, Media en Seine, uh, as you know, uh, was created four years ago by France Info and Les Echos, uh, one of the biggest daily newspapers. It welcomes journalists, industry leaders, official academics to discuss the media landscape, the future of our industry, the du duties and challenges of journalism. So we are very, very proud and happy to have you with us today. Uh, Maggie Aberman, you're a journalist with the New York Times. You're part of the investigative team and the uh, political desk of the Washington bu Bureau. And you're also a political analyst for CNN. But what interests you, the m interest us, sorry, the most today is uh, talking a little bit about your work for four years when you were a uh, White House correspondent covering the Trump presidency at the, at the White House and how basically it was to cover uh, a presidency see that denies facts and truths, and when you were on your part trying to give and to give truths to your uh, readers, how basically after a, a few months after, I would say recovering from these four years covering the White House, how do you feel today? I don't feel recovered. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I'm, I'm 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 working on a book about the former president, so I'm still. Mentally, I'm still. You're still in, in the last four years. Yeah. So, uh, and and even if I I wasn't, I'm not sure that I would feel recovered. This is this was a, this was a, a very intense period of time uh, for every reporter who covered it. Um, there was just constant breaking news. Um, there was, as you said, a constant effort uh, and difficulty in trying to establish a baseline of fact. So, uh, I'll let you know when I've recovered. <laughs> Thank you. But how was your daily work with the president and his team who were trying to lie to the, the, the press and being the press? How, how was the relationships? So there, I would just, um, I would say there were a couple of different layers to this. There's the president himself who says things that are not true, you know, quite frequently, um, and who calls us the enemy of the people and so forth and so on. There are his aides, some of whom share that view and encourage it, and then other uh, others of his aides who, despite what they would say in front of cameras, actually tried to be helpful um, and tried to be uh, truthful and, and get truthful information out. Um, you know, some some more than others, um, but there there were there were people who did try to do that. There were also people who tried to use reporters for their own ends, either to leak out information or to uh, you know, about a policy that they were trying to uh, kill or about a rival staffer in the White House who they were trying to kill. Um, sometimes people would try to shape Trump's opinions on on issues by leaking something out uh, to, to cement him to having to, you know, commit to, to following through with it later. That was very, very hard. And it was a it was a uh, it was a challenge, I think, uh, for all of us for our sense of equilibrium. You knew Donald Trump before uh, he arrived at the at the White House. Were you prepared to such a level of disinformation? Yes. You knew was. it it was that it was going to be like this. I don't I don't think I could have predicted you know the the specifics, but certainly the overall theme. Yes, I knew it was going to be like this. Because Donald Trump was like this before becoming a president, right? Donald Trump has been no different than who he was for a very, very long period of time, going back decades. Um, you know, he 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 created this sort of artifice about uh, who he was through through The Apprentice and through you know press coverage over the years. Uh, and he was, you know, when he ran for president, he w it wasn't just that people knew him and felt like they knew who he was. Um, so information about his business or his past didn't really penetrate. 
but he was delivering a message that a number of voters liked and responded to. And so when you combine those two things, he was able to do very well. Um, but he has a long history of saying things that aren't true. He has a long history of attacking reporters. He has a long history of, you know, race bait, you know, what we would call in New York City race baiting. Um, and so none of this was surprising. Did you adopt any kind of strategy uh, arriving I mean, when he arrived at the White House and you started covering his presidency, did you have a, a specific strategy to work, basically? Because it was not an easy uh, work field. Uh, it's a great question. So there were, there, were, there were two components to it. One is sort of my approach and the approach that the few of us who had covered the campaign did, which was make sure that, you know, there were many, many sources on just sort of basic facts in a story everything else goes by the wayside um, because you, you know you were often picking between you know two or three or four people you know all of whom at various points wouldn't tell the truth so you had to be very careful um, but there was a I would say that a challenge I think for for those of us who covered him before and then those who didn't was that there was a big learning curve for people who didn't cover him before so I think for the Washington based media um, this was a, a jarring change. They had never seen somebody like this, and I think that that was, uh, that was its own challenge. Did you have to, to uh, try to convict your own colleagues sometimes that, that there was a problem in the fact that the, the president was lying? I mean, the, the fact that you knew the president before he became a president gave you a kind of uh, advantage in the situation, but did you have to conv convince your colleagues? It's not that, it's not that people didn't, believe it, it's just that people tend to need to experience things for themselves. And, um, you know, uh, I would, I'll tell you a story. My, my then colleague, Ashley Parker, and I, we covered the Trump campaign together. We did a briefing for our bureau a week or two after the election and um, to tell people what to expect. And there were lots of, lots of questions. Uh, I asked people two years later what they remembered about that briefing and almost to a person everyone said, I thought you were exaggerating hmm. and, you know, that you were tired and they came to realize that we were just saying what we'd experienced. Donald Trump frequently attacked you personally and called you even uh, uh, directly during his presidency. How did you cope with that particular pressure? Um, you know, look, to some extent, it's basically the same as a a reader sending an email or somebody tweeting at you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little different because it's the um, president of the United States and he tends to activate a whole different group of people. Um, I think it was harder on my kids, frankly, than it was on me. But, um, but you deal with it the same way you deal with anything. Did you think he would go as far as calling, for example, the press the enemy of the people or then encourage uh, what happened at the Capitol Hill on the um, 6th of January? So I would say two things. I didn't think he was going to go as far as saying enemy of the people, although I certainly was not surprised that he spent a lot of time trying to undermine the media. Um, in terms of encouraging what happened on January 6th, he certainly, um, you know, he didn't openly encourage people to be violent, but he did encourage his supporters to go march on the Capitol. Um, and he did, you know, stand back for a period of time while this was taking place without saying anything condemnatory about it. So um, uh, I was not, again, anything is possible with him. So mm -hmm. I was not surprised only into the extent that he had clearly decided at some point after the election that he no longer had anything to lose that was constraining his behavior. Um, but it was horrifying watching it. After a few months after he, he finally uh left the White House. Would you say that press won against Donald Trump? That the press won? Yeah, won the battle of opinion, well, of, of truth. No, I don't think... Or, or I don't think because that, it was a kind I of battle. Look, I think that coverage of elected officials is always adversarial. I don't think that's mm -hmm. just with Donald Trump. I think this one, uh, and it's supposed to be adversarial. We're not supposed to be, you know... Friends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like, I mean, you can have collegial relationships and, and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, the story comes first. Uh, so that's, um, I think that's it. I wouldn't put it that way. What I would say is that 
Um, I would say that before January 6th, there were lots of people who were trying to argue, and, and some of them still are. It's not that bad. People overstate what he does. People overstate the impact of what he does. And January 6th was in an unimpeachable, unadulterated view of the impact of his words and behavior. Uh, and so to the extent that, that you know, truth won, I'm happy about that. As you probably know, France is entering a tense electoral uh, year uh, with a high-profile right-wing media populist as a p potential candidate. candidate sorry. Uh, if it's possible, what kind of advices would you give us? Because he's having the same, for the moment, the same strategy as Donald Trump, being very tense, denying facts, uh, and things like that, well, that you know perfectly. What, what could you tell us? <laughs> It's a great question. I, you know, I, I guess one thing that I'm not clear on is how much social media plays a role with the French media. And so, uh, you know, if, if, if it does play a big role and if reporters use it social is. media quite a then I would say be careful because I think that what ended up happening was a lot of us thought that we were fact-checking Trump and that that was really important. And what just ended up happening was we were just disseminating what he was saying that wasn't true more broadly. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, the other thing is just don't be baited into looking like you're having a fight with a candidate. I think that was a that was a, a difficulty for many of us, including myself, uh, over four years. But that that was my my your question about the social your point about the social media was my next uh, question. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. It, that's very interesting because. Uh, uh, we saw in the the recent days what happened in the in the U.S. with Facebook and the revelations from the uh, 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 Wall Street Journal and CBS and things like that. And that, do you think that there is a, a kind of awakening in your country about the role of the social medias in the political debate campaigns and so on? I think, I don't know that I would say there's an awakening. There is certainly a discussion, but I think the discussion is taking place in two different worlds. And one is the discussion of what happens for reporters and how reporters ought to use social media. And I, there's a, you know, obviously a big debate about that. Um, you know, I went from being one of the biggest social media scolds around 10 years ago to using Twitter pretty regularly. So, um, you know, bear in mind that I think these things are fluid. Then there's the debate, which is, how candidates use it. And obviously you saw that it was pretty striking. A, a sitting president was, was taken off of Twitter in his final two weeks after eight, eight, the January eight. 6th riot because Twitter was afraid of what he was going to use the platform to do. Uh, so I think those are two separate issues, but I do think the overarching theme is there is a discussion about the role of social media in our, in our discourse. Uh, you know, I'm of the opinion it has generally not been a positive. There from now a, a world of reporters and a world of social medias? I mean, these two I'm worlds sorry, are... I said I sorry? I, I just couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I was, I was saying, do you think that there is, for now, uh, two different worlds, the world of journalists and reporters uh, trying to tell the, the, the truth and the world of the social medias? Who is what it is, we don't know, it, we, we, it's hard to, to describe it. Well, they are in two different worlds, and that's the problem, is that a lot of reporters, myself included, use social media to put out reporting, to tweet links, and, but sometimes just to tweet thoughts. And on social, you know, when we're doing it for the newspaper, it's laid out a certain way. There are editors. When you're doing it on Twitter, e literally everything looks the same on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And that was one of Donald Trump's advantages. You know, a, a tweet about a, about a, a six-part investigative series from a news outlet looks the same as, you know, random user 999, and it can be very hard to differentiate what's what. So that I don't, they're not, the, they're not separate worlds, and I think that's part of the problem. Thank you very, very much, Maggie Aberman. We can't wait to read your book. We hope it will be translated in French very quickly, as soon as it's, <laughs> it's published. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for having me. And Take good care. luck and good recovery. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.